I am extremely happy to be here with you this morning and honored to bring the word to you. But before we get started, as we just saw, it is Mother's Day. So I do want to take just a moment to wish all of our moms and women here a very happy Mother's Day. So let's give them a hand. And in case you haven't noticed, we have these beautiful flowers up here on the table. And before any of you women leave after service, we would love for you, sorry, we would love for you to grab one. There are different variations of pink carnations. And after doing some research, apparently pink carnations represent gratitude and love. And that's what we have for our women today. So, before we get started, would you pray with me as we move into today's message? Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the opportunity to share your message today, God. I pray, Lord, that you would prepare our hearts and our minds to receive the message that you have for us today. It's in your most precious and perfect name we pray. Amen. Now, as I was praying about what word of encouragement to share for our Mother's Day service. God brought a verse in the book of Jeremiah to my attention. And when I shared that verse with my husband and the message that God had put on my heart in correlation with that verse, he told me that I needed to do more than a word of encouragement. He said that I should be preaching a Mother's Day message about it. Now, to be honest, that was not on my radar. Not at all. <laughs> Giving a small word of encouragement at the beginning of the service is one thing. But preaching an entire message, quite frankly, it terrified me. And I know that God says that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. I myself have reminded people of that very promise many, many times. So I did what any Jesus-loving, good Christian wife would do. And I told my husband, no. <laughs> Absolutely not. I said no because, to be honest, I felt unqualified and ill-equipped. I mean, have you heard my husband preach? <laughs> I thought, how in the world could I ever measure up to that? But then God got a hold of my heart. And he reminded me that, one, I don't need to measure up to my husband or anyone. I just need to be a willing vessel. And two, he reminded me that he is the one that qualifies the unqualified. And he is the one that equips the ill-equipped. Because scripture tells us that every weakness that we have is an opportunity for God to share his strength and show his strength in our life. So here I stand today to share the message that the Lord put on my heart. A message that I hope will speak not to just the hearts of the moms and women here, but a message that I hope will speak to the hearts that God has prepared to receive it. Now let's get to the verse that started all of this. Jeremiah 3, 22. My wayward children, says the Lord, come back to me and I will heal your wayward hearts. From this verse comes the title for today's message, Come Back to Me. Now over the years, something has always stood out when talking to moms and women and people in general who have children in their lives. There's always one prayer that's at the very top of the list. One prayer that's in the deepest part of our hearts. And that prayer is for our wayward children to come back to Jesus or to make their way to Jesus. And as a mom of six kids who are not all perfect all the time, I know that might be surprising because they're pastor's kids, but I can tell you that they're not. Well, this has personally been a prayer of my heart, and it still is. And I think that's why I was so drawn to this verse in the book of Jeremiah. Because as I read the scripture over and over, God showed me that not only is this the prayer of a mother's heart or people's heart for their wayward children, but it's the prayer of our Heavenly Father's heart as well for his children. He wants and he desires for all of his wayward children to make their way to him. In this verse in Jeremiah, it comes to a time when so many of God's children had walked away from him. Sound familiar? 
We see that today in the multitudes. And God's desire is still the same, for his children to come back to him. I'll give you a little background on the prophet Jeremiah. He was the son of a high priest named Hilkiah from the land of Benjamin. And the prophet Jeremiah started receiving messages from the Lord in the 13th year of the reign of King Josiah. And King Josiah, he was the king of Judah. And the Bible tells us that King Josiah did what was pleasing in the eyes of the Lord. However, both his father, Amon, and his grandfather, Manasseh, before him, did not. Scripture says that they did evil in the sight of the Lord, and that they led the people of Judah to do the very same thing. But when Josiah became king, he wanted to change all of that. And Jeremiah, he played an intricate role in God's plan to bring about that change. Jeremiah prophesied through the entire reign of Josiah and until the end of the 11th year of the reign of his son, Zedekiah. Now let's turn to, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to 2 Chronicles in the Old Testament, chapter 34, to get an idea of what was going on in Judah around the time that both King Josiah and Jeremiah came on the scene. So, yeah. So, 2 Chronicles 34, starting in verse 1. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight and followed the example of his ancestor David. He did not turn away from doing what was right. During the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, Josiah began to seek the God of his ancestor David. Then in the twelfth year, he began to purify Judah and Jerusalem, destroying all the pagan shrines, the Asherah poles, and the carved idols, and cast images. He ordered that the altars of Baal be demolished, and that the incense altars which stood above them be broken down. He also made sure that the Asherah poles, the carved idols, and the cast images were smashed and scattered over the great of those who had sacrificed to them. He burned the bones of the pagan priests on their own altars, and so he purified Judah and Jerusalem. Now let's skip down to verse 8. In the 18th year of his reign, after he had purified the land and the temple, Josiah appointed Shaphan, son of Azaliah, Mahasa, the governor of Jerusalem, and Joah, son of Jahaz, the royal historian, to repair the temple of the Lord his God. They gave Hilkiah, the high priest, the money that had been collected by the Levites, who served as gatekeepers at the temple of God. And I want to skip down to verse 14. While they were bringing out the money collected at the Lord's temple, Hilkiah, the priest, found the book of the law of the Lord that was written by Moses. Hilkiah said to Shaphan, the court secretary, I have found the book of the law in the Lord's temple. Now down to 18. Shaphan also told the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a scroll. So Shaphan read it to the king. When the king heard what was written in the law, he tore his clothes in despair. We can see that King Josiah was literally in the process of cleaning up the mess that was the result of the evil done under the, both his father's reign and his grandfather's reign. Getting rid of the idols and the altars and restoring the temple that had once been used to worship the one true God, but then at the hands of his grandfather, it was turned into a place of worship and horrible sacrifice to false gods. And did you catch who it was that found the book of the law in the temple? It was none other than Jeremiah's father, the high priest Hilkiah. I don't want you to miss that. Jeremiah's father, I don't know about you, but that just like totally geeked me out and I thought it was really cool. So the reaction of Josiah after reading the book of the law, well, it shows us just how desperately he desired to not only clean up Judah, but to clean up the hearts of the people of Judah. So you see, God called Josiah to bring change, to lead his people away from the evil that they had practiced under the reign of his father and grandfather and lead them back to the one true God. And he called Jeremiah during his time to prophesy, to deliver his message to the people. Because God wanted 
become a spokesperson to speak his truth to his people, to his children, someone to be his mouthpiece, to show them the error of their ways, someone to warn them of what was to come if they did not turn away from their waywardness and back to the God who loved them. And this would not be an easy task. We know from scripture that the people of Judah had been under the great influence of evil reign from their kings for at least 57 years prior. But even despite this, God's desire was for his children to turn back to him because he is a good, good father and he loves his children, which brings us to our first message point. No matter how far we stray from God, he will always love us and he will always want us back. This was true for the people of Judah, and it's still true for us today. Look at how long the people of Judah had strayed away from God and been wayward. And we're not talking just a little wayward, like you know, stealing their neighbor's donkey in the middle of the night to take a joy ride. <laughs> no, they had strayed far away. When the Bible says that they did evil in the eyes of the Lord, that's exactly what it means pure evil. And even still, even still, God loved them. And his desire was to have them back with him. And his desire is the same for us as well and those we love. No matter how far those we love stray and no matter how far we stray. A while back, I talked about a meme that I had seen. And it said, you will never look into the eyes of someone God doesn't love. Never. And I share that most times, the eyes of the person that we're looking into that we don't think God could possibly love are our own. Because we believe the lie that we are too far gone and that we could never be acceptable to God. And I need you to know, as your pastor and as someone that has not always walked with God, someone, to be quite honest, has flat out walked in the very opposite direction of God down a road full of destructive behavior. Someone who believed the lie that I was too far gone and that I was completely unredeemable. I need you to know that that is the farthest from the truth. And you don't need to just take my word for it, but do take God at his word, the very word that Jeremiah spoke, the very word that shoots down that lie. Jeremiah 31, verse three. I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love. With unfailing love, I have drawn you to myself. Everlasting, unfailing love. Reckless love, like we just sang about. That's the kind of love. So you see, God, he will always love us. And he will always want us back. No matter how far we or those we love stray from him. Now let's move on with our story in Jeremiah. We saw in 2 Chronicles the cleanup effort that was underway, taking place to turn the people of Judah from worshiping false gods back to worshiping the one true God. It was during this time when God wanted a spokesperson to be his mouthpiece, to prophesy to the people of Judah. And God, he chose Hilkiah's son, Jeremiah, to be that spokesperson. Now let's move 10 books ahead from 2 Chronicles to the book of Jeremiah in chapter 1, where it all started, and look at the moment that God called Jeremiah to be his prophet to the nations, to show God's children the error of their ways in hopes of turning their hearts back to their heavenly father. We're going to, Jeremiah chapter 1, but we're going to start right in verse 4. So verse 4, the Lord gave me this message. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. O sovereign Lord, I said, I can't speak for you. I'm too young. The Lord replied, don't say I'm too young, for you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. And don't be afraid of the people, for I will be with you and I will protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Then the Lord reached out and touched my mouth and said, Look, I have put my words in your mouth. Today I appoint you to stand up against nations and kingdoms, 
Some you must uproot and tear down, destroy and overthrow. Others you must build up and plant. Verse 11. Then the Lord said to me, Look, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I replied, I see a branch from an almond tree. And the Lord said, That's right. And it means that I am watching and I will certainly carry out my plans. This is where it all started, where God called Jeremiah. And as we read in verse 6, Jeremiah was hesitant in the role that God got then, the role that God called him to. He says he's too young. Most likely meaning that he felt unqualified and ill-equipped, and that the task of being God's mouthpiece was something that he felt he could not do. I know that feeling. But God reassured Jeremiah in the following verses. He promised him that one, he would put his very words in Jeremiah's mouth. And two, he promised Jeremiah that he would protect him and that he would be with him always. And Jeremiah, he was a faithful servant to the Lord. He dedicated his life to the service of God. He prophesied to the Hebrew people for over 40 years. In that time, he did and said exactly what God told him to. He rebuked God's children for their behavior, and he warned them of the consequences for that behavior, even when it wasn't popular even when he was going up against people that had absolutely no desire whatsoever to turn away from their waywardness and turn back to God. And he spoke the words of love and anguish that came straight from God's heart for his wayward people. Now, I wish that I could say that all God's children listen to Jeremiah, that they turn their hearts back to their Heavenly Father, never to turn away from him again. But sadly, that wasn't the case. Now, don't get me wrong. For many, many years, under the reign of King Josiah and the prophesying of Jeremiah, they did. The Bible tells us that during that time, a new covenant was made with the Lord to keep the commandments of God and to serve their God and follow him only. And scripture confirms that indeed, for all the days of Josiah, they did not turn away from following God. But sadly, after the death of Josiah, Judah once again fell under the reign of an evil king. And despite the continued warnings and pleas from God through his prophet Jeremiah, the people once again turn away from God. Now you may be thinking, then what was the point? Why would Jeremiah continue to prophesy for all those years to the Hebrew people? And why would God have him do so? Especially when the Hebrew people so easily turned their backs on God. Why would they do that? Which brings us to our final point. Don't let the change we can't see keep us from trusting the change that we want to see. Although Jeremiah was a faithful servant of the Lord, he was human. He dealt with the frustrations and the sadness and the anger that came from the horrible opposition he faced. There were many times when his emotions were so overwhelming that he wanted to just call it quits and just leave the Hebrew people to their own demise. Let them face the judgment and the consequences that they so rightly deserve without any further warnings or any further promises of hope and peace if they turn back to God. There were quite a few times when Jeremiah voice his complaints to God. You can read them throughout the book of Jeremiah. And he did not sugarcoat them at all. He was honest about his feelings with God. And I think we can all relate to Jeremiah's frustrations. We may find that we have been praying for the wayward children or the wayward people in our lives for a long, long time. Maybe years, maybe many years. And we might see little to no change. Shoot, we might even see that things look like they're getting worse. And those feelings of pure anguish that come from our hearts, they can and oftentimes do lead us feeling defeated and wanting to just flat out give up altogether. So how do we do it? How do we motivate ourselves to keep on praying and keep on trusting God for the change, the outcome that we want to see and that we desire? 
especially when we're not seeing it? How did Jeremiah do it? The answer is love. Simply love. You see, Jeremiah, he deeply, deeply loved God. And Jeremiah, he deeply, deeply loved God's people, despite their waywardness. He's called the weeping prophet. He's called that because he literally wept for God's people, for God's wayward children, because God broke Jeremiah's heart for what broke his. So it's love. It's love for God, and it's the love that we have for the wayward people, the wayward children in our lives that motivates us. That love that comes from God breaking our hearts for what breaks his. In God's heart, it still breaks for his wayward children. That's why he didn't just give up on them then in Judah and throughout the Bible. And that's why he will not just give up on them or us now. Jeremiah 3, 22. My wayward children, says the Lord, come back to me and I will heal your wayward hearts. You see, the Lord doesn't just listen to the deep prayers of our hearts for our wayward children. No, God understands the aching of our hearts for our wayward children and those we love. Because his heart, it feels that same aching and more. So much so that he sent his one and only son to be the sacrifice for our waywardness. Church, we need to see that Jesus he is the fulfillment of Jeremiah 3, verse 22. Jesus is the way to come back to our Heavenly Father. And Jesus is the way for our wayward hearts to be healed. So as the team comes up, I want to encourage us to not give up, to keep praying those deep, deep prayers of our hearts for the wayward children and the wayward people in our lives. Even when we don't see change happening, even when we see like it may be getting worse, and we may be frustrated, and we may just want to give up. Because when we do that, when we pray those deep prayers of our hearts for the wayward children in our life, we are praying the very desire of God's heart over them. And when our desires line up with God's desires, miracles happen. And God will give us a little glimpse of hope when we keep doing that. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that you do not give up on your wayward children. I thank you, God, for not giving up on me. I thank you, God, for the message that you put on my heart. I thank you for the love and the compassion for your wayward children, God. And I thank you that your desire is to have them back, God, and that you gladly will take them back with open arms. Maybe today you're feeling like you're one of those wayward children, and maybe you are wanting to just give that all to God, but you feel like you're too lost. You feel like you're too far gone. You're believing the lie. I want to encourage you this morning not to believe that lie. I want to encourage you to step out in faith, and if you want to make that decision today, then just say it in the quiet of your house, hearts as I say it aloud. Lord Jesus, I am sorry. I am sorry for my waywardness, God. Jesus, take that away from me. Lord, I want you to come into my heart. I want you to make me clean and make me new in you. Jesus, I believe that you took all of my sins. You took all of my waywardness right to the cross with you. You made that way for me to come back to you. And I believe that three days later that you rose so that I could have eternal life, eternal freedom with you. So Jesus, come into my heart and make me new. I accept you as my Lord and Savior on this very day. If you pray that prayer, then you are no longer a wayward child of God. No, not at all. You are a child of the Most High God. And I want to welcome you to the family. Lord, we love you. Lord, we honor you. And Lord, we praise you on this Mother's Day morning. In your precious name.
Amen.